we want to compete and win for God's glory. Um, we can't be a holy huddle if we're going to do that. Every single person that works at the company, if we're going to scale and we're really going to be able to meet the opportunity we have to redeem uh, some aspects of the telecom industry, we can't do that if we only hire Christians because there will be some people who are subject matter experts that won't join the team. Um, if we only hire Christ followers, we also miss an opportunity to be a great effective witness to some of the best technologists that are out there. Well, hey guys, and welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today's guest, you're going to get a lot of value from. Uh, so today I'm talking with Henry, who's dialing all the way from California. Um, now, Henry Kastner has built phenomenal businesses. And, uh, and the reason why I wanted to put Henry in front of you is, well, 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 there's really two reasons. One, he's built scale in an organization, so it'll, it'll force you to think bigger. But also he's done that whilst pointing a whole bunch of glory back to God and not himself. And that's a very interesting dynamic. It's a great dynamic. It's a rare dynamic. And, uh, and so by doing both of those things, I'm sure it's going to speak directly into your business journey. Hey, Henry, it's so good to talk to you. I'm so glad we could get some time together. Why don't you tell my audience who is Henry Kastner? Well, thank you. It's a great honor, privilege, and blessing to be with you and your uh, audience. Um, who is Henry Kastner? Henry Kastner is a messed up dude, man. I am a sinner, fallen way short of the glory of God. But through his grace, I've been reconciled to him, and it gives me great joy and gratitude to be a part of what he is doing in the kingdom of God and bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Um, I know that sounds pithy and cliche and kind of like the Sunday school version answer of who I am, but uh, at its most core, it is, it is that. Um, beyond that, I am married to Kimberly. We have three boys, 16, 18, and 20. Um, somebody in the more secular world would uh, probably identify me as an entrepreneur and an investor. And now I am also, I spend most of my time actually on the ministry side. Uh, with uh, Faith Driven Entrepreneur and Faith Driven Investor, which are two ministries um, that I'm involved in. But maybe by my core DNA in terms of how the marketplace would view me, uh, an entrepreneur and an investor. That's fantastic. All right, I want to unpack all of those things. I want to I want to talk into your business stories, but also those faith journeys, and we'll just kind of weave those things in as we go. All right, so to my understanding, you've got, you've got bandwidth.com, You've got um, Republic Wireless, and, and those two are linked in, in some way, which we can explore. Um, you've got Sovereign's Capital, uh, which is a VC fund. Um, and then you've got the ministry side, right? The, the faith-driven network, the events, the, the podcast, the, the investment side. Is that, is that everything you're involved in today? Uh, that's a, that's a, the, the, big, the big summary. They're, you're right. There are, they're actually, there are three telecom companies, Bandwidth, Republic Wireless, though we just sold Republic Wireless. Uh, and then uh, Relay Go, which is the telecom company that we still have that's private. And then, yes, Sovereign's Capital, which has, um, which is, it does do be very right. Um, but that's one of four things that we do within a fund family that invests in faith driven entrepreneurs. We have a venture capital fund, which is uh, in fund four right now. We have a private equity fund in the lower to mid markets. Um, and then we have a public market fund. And then we have a fund of funds. So four, four funds, about uh, just shy of a half a billion dollars of assets under management, all focused on bringing God glory uh, in the market by investing in faith driven entrepreneurs. And then, yes, you're 100% right on the ministries. Um, also involved in a ministry here in California that I love called Generosity Barrier, the body of Christ coming together in Silicon Valley, which is thought of as being a very secular spot, but coming together and um, exploring the questions of why we give as the body of Christ and then where we might give together in community in a way that will make a difference uh, locally in the San Francisco Bay Area, but then also worldwide. And uh, yeah, you got it. Awesome. And um, so, so bandwidth was the first, I think, business of, the, of those lot that you kind of started with. Um, help me understand, is that, that's not a client-facing business. That's more infrastructure. Is that right? Like, like it was, it's the thing that underpins um, maybe Google and Skype. And um, I don't actually yeah. know whether you're linked to Twilio, Twilio or Twilio is another version of the same thing, but you're an infrastructure telco rather than an end consumer telco. 
for the most part, you're right. We are we make uh, and provision phone numbers in the software that enables them uh, to companies like uh, Microsoft and Google and others. Uh, Twilio is a very capable competitor. Um, we also do some other things, uh, SIP trunking and some other a- applications with voice over IP. But the primary delivery is providing phone numbers, um, both for voice phone numbers and then also text, SMS, MMS for institutional providers so that if you make a phone call on a platform like Zoom, uh, we may be the underlying service provider to that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then uh, Republic Wireless, which you said you've sold, was that was that an opportunity that you saw you like, or you spun off some, some technology and went, this, this could stand on its own? What made you to kind of have those two entities instead of putting it all under bandwidth? Yeah. So at the beginning, it was all under bandwidth, but pretty, I guess pretty quickly, pretty early in a Republic Wireless's life cycle, we realized that this was uh, addressing a different customer. Originally, um, uh, we endeavored to be an MVNO. We developed technology that allows for a cell phone call to work seamlessly between the Wi-Fi network and the cellular network and back again. And the idea was to be able to, to in a world in which AT&T and some of the other large domestic providers were charging 80 to $100 a month, we thought there's a much better way to be able to provide great customer service and a great technology for a all-you-can-eat package for a wireless customer at $20 if we were able to navigate through how to make the most of somebody when they're on their Wi-Fi at their home or their business. And so as people were to do that, and we gave them a dashboard, which showed them how much time that they're on Wi-Fi, we invited them into a movement of people that had said, we want to be freed from the legacy. How oh, tyranny is too strong of a word, but the legacy um, cost model of some of these larger telecom providers. And, uh, and it worked well. We uh, n- Not huge. I mean, about 300,000 subscribers. But then the technology innovation around that intellectual property portfolio that allowed for uh, phone calls to go over Wi-Fi and the cellular uh, network and back again um, were, was something that the market viewed of having value. Uh, we sold that to Dish Networks, which is a large provider, I think really a global provider of satellite communications. Mm-hmm. And then we took, uh, we had a, um, an element of Republic Wireless that um, was on the hardware side called R- Relay, and Relay Go continues to exist. Think of a cell phone and a walkie-talkie marrying and having a baby. Mm. That's a device that's used for parents that want to uh, want to be slow in providing a screen to young kids, but its primary use is now is in hospitality, where you have a large entertainment venue, say a large stadium or a hotel complex, and it makes for better communication. Them. So That's Relay cool. Go is still independent and private. Bandwidth is the publicly traded company that is uh, in the the phone number business. Yeah, that I love it. And there's nothing better than spinning out a business and then selling it at some point because, you know, who, who doesn't like an exit at some stage? Exits are always fun. Exits are fun. Exits are fun. But you know, there's also something really great about um, maintaining uh, uh, ownership of a company and, and continuing its. Uh, its culture. So bandwidth has been around now for 23 years mm-hmm. and the ability to keep the, the common DNA that, that David and I started bandwidth on, which is faith first, then family, then work, and then fitness. The idea of keeping that intact is, um, is really attractive too. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have a really nice exit, that's great. It's all sorts of different things you can do to uh, it, it, you know, a guy's invitation to participate in the work he's doing in ministries, et cetera. And yet the sustainability of a kingdom honoring, a God honoring business is also really, really important and, and maybe, maybe more important. Mm. All right. So take us back to 23 years ago, you start bandwidth with your best friend. Um, you grew that to something like 300 team members. Is that, is that about right? Um, well, by when I, uh, when I stopped being CEO, I think we we're probably close to six or seven hundred employees, but right. I don't know who's counting? Yeah. Um, we have between the different telcos now, we have we've got about two thousand employees. But I did leave uh, full time leadership of bandwidth to move into the uh, executive chairman role about ten years ago. So it's been a while since I really understood what's going on in the technology world. People will ask me a lot about what I think about. 5G or, you know, fill in the blanks on whatever great telecom technology is out there. And I really don't know. 
to some extent with bandwidth in particular, I'm, um, while Dave and I continue to own and control the company, it's a public, it's what's called a public control company. Um, we, um, I, uh, I, I know enough to be dangerous. Um, instead, what happened, and you alluded to this, we started Sovereign's Capital as an investment fund to invest in faith-driven entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia and in the United States. That's really what I rolled my sleeves up to do for the next decade. Um, and uh, until 18 months ago, I went down to about 20% of my time, about a day a week at Sovereign's, to focus on what we're doing on the ministry side. Okay, cool. Well, now, I know um, just from watching from a distance that culture has been really big for you, team culture, from day one. Um, now, you're, you're hands off now, and I'm sure there's somebody that's still overseeing, making sure that that culture is still alive. I, I want to I wanna kind of explore like how intentional you were about culture, because it's, it, everybody talks culture today, but 23 years ago, maybe nowhere near so much. Um, but you were intentional. And we have a teaching about the five Fs, which are very similar to yours. Ours is faith, family, finance, fitness, and fun. And it's funny, it was just, I have a wife called Kimberly too, that that was just us deciding as a family what we stand for before we ever brought it into the business as a, as a, as a tool. We were just like, as a family, what matters? Faith, family, finance, fitness, and fun, right? And then, and then here you are with, with something similar. So I, I wouldn't mind people kind of understanding how did that play out for you, right? It's cool to have four cool words, but how? How did you actually embed that culture in the business? Um, well, a couple of reasons. And it's interesting you say, you know, 23 years ago, it may not have been that popular. Yeah, that would be a true statement. It's not not true. But if you'd say that 25 years ago, it would be very, very true. So here's what happened. You go back to 1998, 1999, 97 through 99. The world in business completely changed. I mean, I remember I used to wear a suit and tie to work every day. And somewhere around 97, 98, that started to change with the internet and you know these new e-commerce entrepreneurs and pets.com and just all these, you know, just the way that business was done was completely changing. And it was a younger breed of entrepreneur that was really starting to lead the charge. And it was all of a sudden you went from wearing a suit and tie to work every day to people wearing like shorts and flip-flops and playing ping pong at work, right? So this is what the world is like in 1998 to 1999. It was really a business cultural revolution. So in light of that already happening and being a, a, just a real thing in the marketplace, uh, I went to David and I said, David, as we start this new company together, let's be intentional about our culture. Everybody's talking about it. What do we want our culture to be? And it was really David that came back and said, listen, it can't be contrived, right? We're not going to be like the fun guys and we're going to, you know, like have like, you know, popcorn Thursdays and draft beer Tuesdays or something like that. We need to make sure that if this culture that we want to have has any sustainability to it, it needs to just like you've done, Wes, just same thing. It needs to mirror who we want to be as individuals. So what do we want to be? So if for us, it was faith, family, work, fitness. David is a world-class endurance athlete. So I'm a neighborhood class endurance athlete, but fitness is a big part, a big part of our culture in the beginning and continues to this day because there's an authenticity behind it. David and I would work out and go for runs or bike or swim every day for an hour and 15 minutes at lunch. We figured that if we're doing that, let's let other people do that too. And so fast forward 23 years and we've had the, the citywide uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, citywide ice hockey championship team and ultimate Frisbee and basketball and just countless uh, sports. We've had, um, we entered a team into the Trans Rockies mountain bike race and finished second. We entered a team into the Race Across America, thought of as the hardest endurance cycling event in the world, and won it. I mean, so it's a big part of who we are, but it just is, it just mirrors, mirrors the interest that David and I had. And we also love working. When we work, we feel his pleasure to take the, you know, take a, a little bit of a sheet out of the Chariots of Fire playbook. And then family, we've got nine kids between us. And then, of course, our faith is the most important thing. How that manifested itself was us mirroring it and leading. The shadow of a leader, by the way, is really important. It's how we, it's what we do rather than what we say that really makes an impact. And we could talk ad nauseum to that. But the second thing was, is that when you bake your culture into your story, it's really attractive. Um, and for David and I, uh, we wanted to make sure that the employees are coming on board into our company, 
understood our founding story and what made the founders tick. And so David and I got a chance to talk about our faith. David was a lifelong believer. I was a, a like you, an adult convert. I went through my entire career in Wall Street. I wasn't a believer, but I was able to talk to people about my coming to faith in a way that wasn't prescriptive or presumptuous, but was my story. And then I wanted to know what their story was and wanted them to make sure that they knew that while faith was the most important value, we weren't prescribing that it had to be Christian faith, although that was the case for David and I. And that was uh, that was it. It's so leading by example, the shadow of the leader, and then sharing our story as we endeavored to understand the story of our own employees. That's how we made it real. So I want to bring that point home because I think what you are saying is you can't have a culture that that you don't first live out. So it, like it, 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 well, cause you're not going to be able to keep that up for one thing, right? Having a culture that you don't f- fully live by. So you just decided that it starts with you and it'll flow out from there. Sure. And so I, I want to drill down on that a little bit, if you'll permit me. I, we have this podcast called the Faith Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. And one of my co-hosts is a guy named Rusty Roof. And Rusty was in charge of human resources at uh, Atari and then also Electronic Arts, the big video game manufacturer. He's also at Pepsi, but he's a student of this. And he says, when he was at Atari, the it was a video game company. and uh, But for whatever reason, the CEO of this multiple thousand employee business always wore dress slacks to work. And so everybody did. So he left. The new CEO came in next day and he had an all hands and he did it in jeans. He said it was amazing. He said, out of like 2,200 employees or something like that, like two thirds of them the next day wore jeans. <laughs> there was no change in the dress code or what was written about what you could or couldn't wear. But just by virtue of how the leader led and what he did, he had a following. And you know, you'll see Simon Sinek does such a great TED.com talk on this about the value of the why of leadership and this kind of concept of a shadow of a leader. But yeah, that's. That's that's really important for your listeners, I think, to hear about how we model this out. The other thing I'll mention is that we can talk about our faith. We can talk about our stories. But when things are really, really hard, that's when our employees are watching. So we have 10 different product lines. We effectively power Google Voice, 10 different product lines at Google. If our network goes down, Google's network goes down, their voice network goes down. That's a pretty big deal. So when the red phone rings, and David is able to pick it up and respond with urgency because the situation calls for it, but also with a calm that portrays the fact that his identity ultimately is not as the CEO of bandwidth, but as a beloved child of God. When he does that, that's the chance where you can really model out and witness to the, your faith and the culture. That's when it really, really matters, when it would otherwise be really hard to do so. Oh, hey. I hope you're enjoying this week's episode. Listen, I'm just here training a group here in this room, but I need you to subscribe to my channel. Guys, do you think they should subscribe to the channel? Guys, please subscribe. I want to come back to identity because it's a huge topic that we're going to look at on its own. Before we do, I want to go, you said something that I heard somewhere else that I thought was really profound and will we'll kind of mess with some thinking, I think, for most of our audience. And you were talking about how you hire, right? So one of the challenges for a lot of people when they're faith-driven is that to scale up a business to where you did, you can't just be going to church and asking for Christian people to come work for you because A, there's probably not enough and B, they may not be the best people. And you said, and correct me if if I'm wrong or right, you said, we hire regardless of faith background and social orientation, right? Something like that. Yeah. So can you talk into that? Because there's a lot of people who are like, I can't be unequally yoked and I, all, this, all this kind of stuff. And you, uh, I, I personally think that if you, if you decided to stick to, I want a Christian team, you'd have 23 people on your team and not 600 or whatever. Like, you know, what made you go that way? And how do you rationalize going that way and, and being a radical believer? So uh, a couple of thoughts on this. One is um, uh, we want to compete and win for God's glory. Um, We can't be a holy huddle if we're going to do that. Every single person that works at the company, if we're going to scale and we're really going to be able to meet the opportunity we have to redeem uh, some aspects of the telecom industry, we can't do that if we only hire Christians because there will be some people who are subject matter experts that won't join the team. 
Um, if we only hire Christ followers, we also miss an opportunity to be a great, effective witness to some of the best technologists that are out there. Some number of people that have come to work at Bandwidth have ended up um, sharing our faith ultimately. And over time, through gentleness and respect, through relationship, we're able to share the reason for the hope we have. And uh, and so that's a that's a great opportunity. But I would say that I'd caveat it with one thing. I do think that uh, that the New Testament teaches us that we should not be unequally yoked. And that means with a partner. I can't imagine doing bandwidth with a partner that didn't share my faith. To, and I think that that's the way that God equipped us. Now, there are a good number of people that we've invested in, although we vastly prefer businesses that are run by partners. A good number of people we've invested in that are not in a partnership. Uh, there are a lot of people in the ministry that we serve that are not in partnership. And yet of the 12 marks of a faith driven entrepreneur we have in the ministry, one of them is in partnership. And so I don't think that you can effectively run a business uh, without uh, having a great partner. Now, does that mean if you're listening to this podcast and you have a non-believing partner that you break up with them? No, I don't think you do that either. I think that the Bible, I think that you can take what the Bible says about marriage, for instance, and which is the ultimate partnership. And I think that you can extend that into the work environment. But I do think that if you're starting a new business, you need to look for somebody who's going to share your faith. If for no other reason, then the joy it will give you through the times of real trouble when you're going through the valley of shadow of death, and then also the celebrations. If you can't align toward the bigger goal of honoring God, knowing God, in the marketplace, being part of his redemptive process. And that can't be your North star along with your partner. And instead it just becomes about a bottom line focus. I think you're lost. And I think it compromises your business success. I definitely think it takes a lot of the, the beauty and the joy out of it. And uh, so I would say that, yes, don't be a holy huddle for the entirety of your company, but choose your partner well and pray that God will bring you somebody who shares your faith. And I think that's what I love so much about you and David's story and the business you've built is that you you are uncompromisable uh, in your faith. I mean, sinner, yes, sure, join the club, but but you competed in a very competitive marketplace. I won't say and won, but and and won regularly. And I think that's just such a like a, a phenomenal place to come from is that is that you were able to live in the two extremes, right? And and uh, and I guess that's why I'm asking these questions to get people to understand that you can you can have both. You know, you you you, you can bring, uh, for a better word, secular people into your business, and they don't you know they don't damage you or that you know they don't throw you off course. I'm sure they'll, I'm sure there was dramas along the way, but but you've you've been able to hold fast to your identity um, and and still compete and win in a marketplace, which is which is really profound, I think. Well, thank you. I think, you know, some of your listeners will go ahead and look at the bandwidth stock price right now and see it having gone from a high of the 190s down to 15 and say, gosh, have they really won? So they may take issue with that. And yet I think that the win part is that we endeavor to be faithful and obedient. We have this with a couple of thousand employees across the companies. We have this great opportunity to love them well, provide them with real opportunity to innovate. And through the grace of God, we've got all those things. Um, we, we have been blessed with uh, you know, north of about $560 million revenue run rate. So we do have been able to achieve some scale. And yet our identity should never be in that, nor in our stock price. Because I'll tell you, if it was in just in the fact that we kind of competed and won in terms of a stock price, I would be so despondent. I wouldn't mm. be able to make this podcast because yep. if, if you look at the stock price. Yep, definitely. But this is still a moment in time, right? So who knows what happens in three, four, five, seven, 15, 32 years time. So it's a moment in time, the stock price, and uh, you you would have worked out a long time ago that if you feel if you feel uh, if you feel better because the stock goes up, you're going to feel bad when it goes down, and that's a surefire way to get crook, to get sick, you know. <laughs> so. Absolutely, How, yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. Yeah. All right, so but it wasn't all easy, right? We make it out like you've built this phenomenal organization, took it to IPO, and and now you just talk to people. I want to go back to something else that I've heard you say. You went to do a cap raise back in the early years. I'm not sure how many years in. And you were 0 for 40. So you did 40 pitches to VC firms 
and got a, and got a goose egg response. Like, I want to know what that was like, because that would have felt like a kick in the teeth, probably questioning where you're going, I'm, I'm guessing. Is the Lord in this? All those sort of things. Take me back to those years where it was looking like it wasn't working. I'm not a very good fundraiser. Um, it was amazing. We actually had maybe 135 pitches uh, in meetings across those 40 funds. So 40 funds said no to us, but many of them ended up having like four or five meetings with us. And so, you know, that many meetings and uh, not being successful was like banging our head against the wall. Now, through God's grace, we didn't raise money. Okay, this is early on. We were two and a half, three years in. We'd spent through the money we'd already had. Um, if we'd walked out with a $20 million term sheet, excellent chance we'd out of, be out of business and we wouldn't be in a place where we are right now. Um, no, Just almost no doubt about it. So um, when Dave and I look back on that time period, and we reflected on it recently because we went away with our boys on a on a camping trip. And just thinking about just the, you know, at that time it had been in 20 years, so just reflecting back. We both realized that that season was characterized by us being more willful than faithful. So don't get us wrong. I mean, we're faith-driven entrepreneurs. We'd pray before we'd walk into a meeting with Red Point or Sequoia or USVP or people like that. But David and I never really prayed and fasted about whether we should be raising money to begin with. And so many different times during our career, when we reflected back about like where we were in our spiritual, you know, our faith journey, and so many times we were trying to do things under our own power. And those times would be characterized by not seeking God wholeheartedly first. And it's just, you know, your 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 listeners will be familiar with the with the lessons from the good kings of Judah, right? I mean, so you got bad kings of Judah, good kings of Judah, bad kings of Judah. It's easy. Don't do what they did. The, the good kings of Judah, man, that's where we can get hung up. And every one of the good kings, but maybe one, maybe it was Hezekiah, I can't remember. But like eight or nine of them made huge critical errors by not seeking God. Yeah. And that's what we did in the early days. In that 0 for 40, we weren't seeking God. Yeah. Yeah. My first, When you were telling the story, my first thought was Joshua and the Gibeonites. Right, oh, he, yeah. he, you know, they they come around the corner with their moldy bread and their and their tatty clothes, and they've got no water, and they're like, "Hey, yeah. we heard you're going to fight for us. We've come a long journey." They were literally just over the hill, and 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 they and he and 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 Joshua doesn't inquire of the Lord, does, and it ends up being a huge a partnership that causes him huge problems, you know, over the rest of time. And and you, Joshua's a great guy, you know, Joshua yeah. and Caleb. I mean, think about you know, two of the twelve that really came back and had a heart after God and. We're a glass half full and just really w w building into God's promise. But Joshua, as great as he was, and you know, these are people again who are after God's heart. And so they did what they thought made sense, right? And they're doing what they, you know, it seems to make sense. And, you know, it's not like an evil type of thing, like, like bowing down to like an Asher pole or something crazy that like you just know not to do. No, I mean, they make the decisions seem to make sense. Dave and I are like, you know, we're running this business. You know, gosh, we need some growth capital. Let's go ahead and do it yeah right sense we weren't theoretically sinning in that other than to not seek god out is a sin and god in his infinite mercy allowed us to bang our head against the wall um and did not grant us what we thought was in our best interest but did something better and yet our punishment was uh, at least the punishment we know of was two and a half years of just like bang it was just so frustrating so if you didn't raise capital, did you just get really good at selling? Like, how did you fix the, the, the capital issue? We, we grew much, much slower. So the reason we were raising capital is because we thought we could, you know, double, triple the size of the business. Um, and so at the beginning phase, we just ended up growing just much slower, you know, 20, 30%. Uh, we ended up bringing on board some angel investors. We ended up floating a small convertible debt deal, which ended up being a perfect fundraising strategy for us because we had enough cash flow to be able to service debt. And a lot of the investors ultimately did not exercise their option to convert and ended up being a great non-dilutive uh, way for us to get uh, financing. And then um, we ended up growing it, you know, between, so the real difficult fundraising time was say 2002 to four. But then from 2005 to 2009, we were the fifth, no, sorry, fourth fastest growing privately held company in the country because we we're able to lay a much better foundation. 
we were during that time of slower growth, we were able to focus on delivering a great product. Our growth didn't outstrip our ability to serve our customers and to delight them. And the only growth since we didn't have any capital to buy customers was we had to delight the customers we had to get uh, to upgrade them. It's called dollar cost net retention, you know, a negative churn, just to sell more product to the customer and delight them so much that they felt really good in referring business to us, which is the best kind. Because that business, that cohort, those that you've delighted and those that come in as a referral from those you've delighted tend to stick around and are mm-hmm. stickiest the most. So it gives you great CAC to LTV. And um, yeah, so that's what ended up happening. That's awesome. Were you around for the IPO or had you already left the day-to-day operations? I was still on the board, but I had left the day-to-day operations. So that was, that was, all, it was all God's providence, but it was all, it was all David and the team. Yeah, cool. Like um, I gave, you know, it was nice enough to allow me some uh, some great photo ops with the ticker tape and all that kind of stuff, and so I was able to celebrate. And then Dave and I continue to be the owners of the business, but to be very clear, I can't take any credit for what bandwidth has done over the last um, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Mm. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, sovereigns capital. Um, what what was the desire there? Was it um, uh, was it did it come out of a place of like my forty and O um, and I want to fix that issue to make it easier? Was it was it out of the unequally yoked partnership where like you saw faith based entrepreneurs go on to take institutional money and then just getting squashed in their faith, um, or or was it just a passion play? Like what made you take some of your capital that you'd made and decide to run a fund? So great question and great illustrations. It was really, it was all four of those things. Um, if I were to kind of sum it all up together, it was this sense that despite our brokenness and the many, many mistakes we made, we saw God honoring the work that we had as we endeavored to love our neighbor, love our partners, our vendors, our customers, of course, our employees, of course. And so the as we talked to our peers, other people who we knew were Christians or entrepreneurs, our sense was that they didn't feel as comfortable as we did in sharing our story. And um, they felt a real secular pressure of kind of repressing their faith. Mm-hmm. And we thought that that was a, a tragedy because we thought that that kept them from really kind of living into this relationship with God that would give them more joy in the workplace and and being able to be this effective witness and also tying their work into what God was doing in the world. So um, the, the thought was, um, if we are strapped to the mast with these people, we have skin in the game. I got to be careful about mixing too many metaphors, but if we're in it with them, then we have an opportunity to help them in a direction towards spiritual integration. And to be clear, because we're operators, help them on things like Cactel TV, intellectual property, channels to market, financing, et cetera. But then also to ask them, gosh, what does it look like to have a chaplain at this business? How do you think about the biblical message of generosity with the excess money that you make from this company? Those types of things. And so that's what gave birth. Those plus all four of the things you mentioned, which were very much valid, gave birth to Sovereign's Capital. That's cool. Um, And uh, uh, from what I hear, it's uh, US and Southeast Asia, I think, from from what you said, or Asia. Um, Plans to go broader? Can, can we get you down to the? Can we get you down to the the, the back blocks of the desert down here in Australia? <laughs> we should be so lucky and blessed to be able to participate in the work that faith driven entrepreneurs are doing in in Australia. Um, the answer is that Sovereign's Capital has only uh, invested in Indonesia, Singapore, and United States. So that's that's that those are our areas of focus. Um, however, of course, uh, the faith driven investor movement which where we have said, gosh, there are some great opportunities from faith-driven entrepreneurs all around the world. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story on that. It, it, it kind of gave birth to it, trying to solve a problem. You know, four or five years into Sovereigns, we were getting lots and lots of uh, entrepreneurs from all around the world that were coming in. And we weren't able to invest in like 99 out of 100, which is par for the course for most institutional venture capital funds. And back then we were only venture capital. Um, but for a group of guys, and gals that wanted to get involved in this to be an encouragement to faith driven entrepreneurs. If you say no, 99 out of 100 times, you're not being an encouragement. So, uh, you know, it's, and it's a good reasons not to invest. Wrong stage, wrong industry, geography didn't fit, et cetera. But a guy came in, um, 
maybe about five years ago, and I remember taking the call, and he said, um, my name is Anatol. I've got a real estate business I'd like you to look at investing in in Moldova. I'm like, well, this is going to be easy. An easy no. Um, I don't even know how to calculate a cap rate, so I shouldn't invest in real estate. And I'm not even sure that Moldova is a country, so we can't <laughs> invest. I kind of thought Moldova might be a country, but you kind of get what I'm saying here. But he said, look, you have to understand that I really need somebody to come alongside me and help me to navigate through these issues I have. Like, should I have a non-believing partner or not? And I remember thinking at the time, I don't have time for this. I've got, you know, we've got at the time, maybe 30 or 40 portfolio CEOs who spent a lot of time with them. That's kind of where our ministry is now. But I really felt that the Holy Spirit convicted me. And that's what gave birth to the Faith Driven Entrepreneur Ministry, which now serves entrepreneurs in 180 countries. And where we're able to help many of them find access to capital from other funds that do invest in Moldova or Australia or some of the other places. It's this movement of God is so much bigger, of course, than Sovereign's Capital. And that's why I have so much joy now, because now every entrepreneur that comes in, we can serve, we can love on, and we don't charge for what we do. It's no cost, no catch. And so that's a great, that's a great way for us to be able to do that ministry and, and, and solve that problem we had where we were being such a discouragement to so many. Mm. <laughs> I reckon I get an email, I get two or three a week from somebody that I've never met in most cases who just say, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, I want to scale up my business, I'm looking for a Christian fund, right? Uh, or, or the other question of like, I'm thinking of taking on a partner and they're not a Christian, should I do it? And so, and really, I mean, like you, I'm like, I've got my hands tied. Like, there's only so much I can do. And I haven't been able to find um, a fund or a network. Obviously, I, I now know that that's what you guys are running. But um, it'll be great to point a whole bunch of people back to the investor network um, and uh, and possibly back to you because I, I think it's a really big need and it's a really big concern for people to be able to find um faith-based investors and, and faith-based VC. I think that's a really big need in the world. You know, there's there's a whole lot of hard luck stories about institutional investors who come in and, and over time do the wrong thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we've got to protect that, I guess, which is, which is something that you guys are really um, hammering home on. So that's awesome. Um, what would you like, uh, I, I want to give you a platform to kind of promote uh, maybe the Faith Driven Network or invest or whatever you want to do. There'd be people listening now and uh, and you, you would have picked a whole lot of interest. Um, maybe a URL, uh, maybe you know a social handle. Like what could you point people to that go, this guy has got something I'd like to connect him with. What, what could you give us? Wow, that's it. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Um, so we there are two principal websites, Faith Driven Entrepreneur and Faith Driven Investor. Our ministry is about content and community. You know, Wes, I know enough about the work that you do to know that uh, you're able to go really, really deep with a lot of entrepreneurs. We tend to uh, foster a community, um, uh, but we don't aren't able to give like direct on the job, like here's how I solve my marketing problem. And here's how I think about, you know, it, it, except look reviewing all these different types of term sheets there's what you're able to do and what others like Trigan in south africa are able to do and praxis in the united states uh, ocean and, and and there's so many there's a global collab of 38 um, organizations that go really deep in helping an entrepreneur really formulate a business plan uh, we don't do that what we do is we bring together uh faith and entrepreneurs and community of peers to be able to process great storytelling and teaching together and had 12 to 15 people just encourage each other, process what they learned along these, the marks of a faith-driven entrepreneur, which start with call to create, identity in Christ. And that's this kind of, this viral networking um, uh, uh, function we have. We have 567 volunteer coordinators around the world who bring together these networks of, uh, of peers. Uh, faith-driven investor was started uh, about 18 months after Faith Driven Entrepreneur, when one of those entrepreneurs called up and while I gave him a link to a podcast, I realized I wasn't really scratching his itch. He had a business in Rwanda and we realized there's an opportunity to hook up uh, entrepreneurs that are driven by their faith with like-minded investors from the West. And then generally uh, in recognition of the fact that as cool as we'd like to think Sovereign's Capital is, 
it most assuredly is not the only game in town. We found hundreds of institutional funds now that have some level of written spiritual integration plan on what they do. And so Faith Driven Investor is a, a ministry focused on that and at advancing this movement of God over the last three years. It's been unbelievable how Christ flowers are coming to understand they have an opportunity to store their investment capital in a way that uh, participates in what God is doing in the world, not at the expense of biblical values, but because of them. And because they're realizing that every investment has an impact and that doesn't need to be just impact investing in terms of patient or concessionary capital. It can mean market return capital too. So there's a massive movement going on. That's what faith driven entrepreneur and faith driven investor are about. Awesome. Thanks for asking. All right. Well, we'll put up some, some little links and the guys can come and find you. Um, one more question for you. Um, there are some, there'd be people that are listening to this right now. I mean, I, I absolutely love our audience and our listeners and engage with them at every opportunity. So they'd be, they'd be running on a treadmill now, running, you know, push bike, mowing a lawn, um, whatever, at work. I just want to give you kind of blank space to say, what would you say to uh, a faith-driven entrepreneur who's possibly early in their journey um, and they want to do something big for God um, and be an example and chase down influence, whatever God's got for them? What would you say to those people? Uh, you asked the best questions. I love the way you kind of like give me this free form space. Thank you. Um, I would tell them two. I tell them three things. Okay. Number one, the work that they are doing that God has called them to do is really, really important for God's kingdom. Uh, we are God's image bearers. We're creating the image of a God who worked, uh, seven days. I'm sorry, six, out of seven days in the gospel of John it says that his work continues to this day. When we lean into the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply, taking dominion over all things, we are doing really important work. So number one, make sure that they feel really validated that their work is important in and of itself, not just as a mechanism to fund the work of other ministries, though that's important too. So their work really matters. Number two, that their identity is in Christ. To the extent that anybody who interacts with any aspect of what we do is able to understand more deeply how loved they are by God and that out of a realization of that good news that they're able to then return to the altar of work, so to speak, out of joy and gratitude with all that they have. There's a message I need to hear again and again and again. My identity is not in how much assets under management we have at Sovereigns. It's not in how well bandwidth is doing, whether the stock is up or it's down. My identity is as a beloved child of God. Number three, uh, I am an investor. Uh, I love, I'm a faith-driven investor. I love looking at scripture for different passages that will help me to better understand my calling as an investor. The parable of the talents is a great one, but I'd submit to you and your listeners that the best one to help us to understand how to be an investor, both as entrepreneurs and investors, is the parable of the sower. If you're listening to the Kingdom Podcast with Wes, I'm going to make an assumption that you have passed the test that are the sun scorching the seed off of the pavement or the birds taking it away. What you have to worry about, what I have to worry about, maybe even what Wes has to worry about, are the vines that entangle us. And what are the vines? Scripture tells us it's the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. If we can navigate through that, and we can make it through that final test. We're told that we get a return of 160 or 30 fold. Was if you get a 10 bag or a 10x return on investment, it's a big deal. I mean, a really big deal. Worst case scenario in God's economy, you get a 30x return. Could be 60, it could be 100. And that's a big deal. So how do you overcome the worries of the world and deceitfulness of riches? It's it's with the form of God, it's time in God's word, and it's time in community. That accountability of being in a community with other faith-driven entrepreneurs and faith-driven investors gives you a real fighting chance at working on it. So those are the three things I'd tell an entrepreneur that's looking to get started. Henry, you've been a massive blessing to me uh, and obviously our listeners and, um, and, and to many more people around the world as you do business and, uh, and, and do your ministry. Uh, I love watching the way you do family online. Uh, I follow you on social. I think that you are the poster family for Hoka running shoes. They seem to feature in nearly every post. 
Um, but uh, I do love hooker running shoes. Yeah, but you, you guys, you guys uh, are a living example of what it means to be a faith-based entrepreneur. And I just want to say I appreciate you and uh, look forward to walking a journey with you over the next however many years. It's it's been great to get to know you. And you, I'm grateful for you and your ministry, and and thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast. Well, guys, that's it. At the end of every episode, here's what we do. I say to you, okay, what was the top three things that jumped out to you on this podcast? And I want you to put the top one. We covered a fair bit of ground, but I want you to put the top one in the comments so that I can engage with you there. Guys, I will see you next week for another episode of the Kingdom Business Podcast. <laughs>